watenda wafaze, watendi mbogoto, hoza gopa. It was a, a feeling of great honor. And I sometimes used to find, ask myself if I was worthy of that place, you know. Coming from the society that I came from and being the person that I was, and I felt deeply honored and privileged that I was chosen by the women to be one of the leaders in that group. That period in the 50s characterized what we called the defiance campaign period. People like Sophie de Braem grew up out of a pact that was signed by da Dr. Dadu, Dr. Kuma and Dr. Naika, the three doctors pact. And it was really to advance liberation movements throughout the country on a non-racial basis to defy all the apartheid laws at that period. Sophie the Brain was a young a woman who emanated through the structures of trade union movements. And she was selected by the women, Albertina Sisulu, Helen Joseph, and others who were organizing the Women's March Against Pass Laws to the union buildings to be one of the women who will carry the petitions uh, to the then Prime Minister. We are chosen because we are we're now a multi, you know, organization that involves every uh, uh, body. We had Helen Joseph, who was representing the women of the uh, Congress of Democrats, that was the white women's organization. We had um, uh, Kachalia who was representing the Indian uh, women. We had uh, Ms. De Brain who was representing the Colored People's Organization. And we had Lillian Ngoyi who was representing the ANC Women's League. They took our protest forms to the Prime Minister who was straight home in those days. All the years we had our own little separate organizations in South Africa. Indian women had their organization, the colored women had theirs, and the church women had theirs, and so on and so forth. Having worked uh, hard, organizing and mobilizing, but not knowing for sure whether the women would be coming, all of them. We knew we couldn't take all the women from, from the village, all of them to, the, to Pretoria. So what we decided, we, are going, we made some uh, uh, papers, you know, forms, so that whenever you want to go to Pretoria, if you've got a, a small child, you just said, I'm, I'm not prepared to carry a pass. And the day before we were due to go to Pretoria, on the Tuesday, we got the news that all the licenses for the buses that, we, that the women had hired from all up and down the reef had been cancelled. And so there were no buses. And so it was Robert Kesher, we went in my car and we went all up and down the reef saying to the, to the women, no buses, you must get yourselves to Pretoria by train. But not knowing whether they would be able to. We, we just we took everything in blind faith that they would be able to get to Pretoria. And um, early in the morning we were on our way to Orlando to pick up Lillian because we were going, must get to Pretoria very early. And we drove in nuclear below the great embankment and the trains came across the top of the embankment. And as we drove there, we looked up and I saw the train. Mm -hmm. And out of the, every window in the train, there were women's heads and they were, and they were waving and shouting and singing, and the freedom songs they were singing, and I knew that they, it was going to succeed. I cried, I couldn't help it. We got 20,000 women to Pretoria without anything. Women carried their own, what we call, scuff tins, their lunch boxes. And you should be asking what was in that lunchbox. Every woman who came, came on her own steam. Children on their backs. Enough to eat for the number of days that they would be there. Whether it was bread and milk, water that they brought for themselves. There were no special arrangements made. And you know the amazing thing about this was that it was done with stealth, secrecy and effectiveness. And 20,000 women emerged on that day. It would have been more, but some of them were, you know, as they were coming from other places, they asked police the way to the union buildings in Pretoria. 
And the police said, oh, you want to go to the uh, union buildings? Come, I'll show you. And they took them by the arms and led them into their vans and locked them up for the day. And we were so many. So when we were about to start, you know, marching, a word from the police, from the loudspeaker, from the police to say, our march is banned. Fortunately for us, our appointment with the Prime Minister was not cancelled. So we walked up the hill with this mass of women, 20,000 women, walking behind us, like I say, in a very dignified way, very composed. They carry themselves magnificently with their babies on their backs, as if the babies knew they shouldn't cry. There was not a sound as we stood in the amphitheater after walking up. These women did it for themselves, out of the meager little bit that they had, which showed a true commitment, that they wanted change. That was well organized in the sense that in 1954, we decided as women, the Women's League, ANC Women's League, uh, initiated that because we said in 1954, let's form an organization that will involve every woman in South Africa, black and white, so that our voice should be strong. So we formed that organization. When we defined in 1956, we were already together with every woman in South Africa. So that's how we succeeded to get 20,000 women to go to the union buildings. We decided that it was time to take the petitions to Stridum, that is 56. So all of us, Lily Ngoy, Rahima Musa, myself, and Helen Joseph, had these bundles of petitions on our arms and we walked to Stridum's office hoping that we could present the petitions to him so that he can read what the women demands were. The regime wouldn't come out to meet them, you know, uh, to, to, to take the, the petition, uh, refused, the Prime Minister refused. The stratum ran away from us, but we left the uh, protest forms on his doorsteps. So we knocked on the door and of course, without realizing, Strider had run away. So Marian Goy uh, said, well, you ought to have been here because he knows that we were coming. We wrote him a letter. So if he's not here, yeah, you take it and give it to him. And she shoved the petitions on this young man who went like that, but he all held it. And then Alan too, and Rahima too, and he was so overloaded that some of them fell down on the ground and I just shoved mine on the table. We told them that, well, we are not taking all these forms with us. We are going to leave them with him. He can read them for two years. Because there are so many, the table was put on the table, the table was packed. And Lillian then explained to the women that Stridum isn't available, he had run away for the women. And of course, that's when uh, they sang for him. Uh, you, you know, you strike a woman, you strike a, a, a rock, you know. The women broke into song and sang the prominent song that we all know about that have become immortalized. If you touch the women, you have struck a rock and you will die. The demonstration was such a success that it was a jubilation to all, young and old, and the women were recognized and our demonstration and our Women's Federation, Federation of South African Women was recognized. The men were delighted with our great success because you know that became the historical moment in the struggle against the racist regime. Women from every walk of life, in the, in, from every organization came together to form the Federation of South African Women and uh, people like who stayed in the background, but were really the force behind this march. Masi Sulu, Helen Joseph, and people like, uh, uh, Lillian was right in the front, uh, Lillian Ngoi. But, uh, you know, they were there, they were strong, 
they were resolute. And, and she comes from that, from that stock of women. The people who made it possible to take place are the women, because we are in the majority, and the women now, because they were already informed about the organization that was coming of the Women's League, the Federation of South African Women. There was a woman's charter before there was a freedom charter. So it's in fact the woman's charter and the mechanism by which it was collected that influenced the style and orientation of how the freedom charter was collected. Because the woman's charter was, a collect, was collected from women, women's voices on the ground. The activists of Masi Sulu and them went out and said to women, what would you like to see happening in this country? The Freedom Charter is a very significant document in our struggle in that it was not imposed on the people by a few office bearers of any organization, but it was a document which was drawn by the people themselves and it embodies the aspirations of the people themselves. Dear Auntie Sophie, happy birthday. We wish you many, many more and keep strong and be as resilient as you have always been throughout your life. 80 is a wonderful beginning of a whole new life for you. And we hope, Auntie Sophie, that you will leave with us some of the lessons that you learned in your youth.